I'm Laura Kovacs, and I'm honored to join you this evening. Following the book talk and presentation, we will have a Q&A. Please submit your questions anytime using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. And now to introduce our guest. Moral, political, and social questions pervade Barbara Kingsolver's many works of fiction and nonfiction, including the Poisonwood Bible, the Bean Trees, and the Lacuna. She has won a devoted readership and a raft of awards, including the National Humanities Medal and the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. She last joined us at the Free Library with Unsheltered, a novel about crumbling structures, literal and societal, and characters facing the double-edged nature of being sheltered, meaning safe and sound, but also unworldly and unprepared. Science and advocacy for the natural world are recurring themes in her work. If there ever was an opportune time for one of our most esteemed writers to artfully render the importance of science, it is right now. She joins us tonight with her new poetry collection, How to Fly in 10,000 Easy Lessons. The screen is all yours. Thanks so much. I'm, I'm uh, I thank you for inviting me back. I, I think that I've done an event for the Philadelphia uh, Free Library every time I've been on a book tour in recent memory um, because I really I really love what you do and I, I believe in libraries and your library. So thanks for, for being there, for doing everything you do uh, for the community that needs you more than ever right now. Um, thank you, uh, Philadelphia Library, for the hard work that I know you're doing to, to address inequality and injustice, both outside and inside of your doors. And um, people of Philadelphia, uh, I assume that, that um, first of all, I have to assume you're there. Uh, I have to use my imagination to uh, imagine, to to trust that you're all there watching. But uh, if you are mostly in Philadelphia, my heart is with you right now this week as your city is, um, is, is burning with outrage, with grief, um, um, with, with sadness for yet another death of a young man. And, um, I, 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 what I want to do tonight is to um, try to bring you, as I'm hoping to bring the world through poetry, um, just a bit of a relief package, something I can put into the world that reminds all of us in a world that's horribly divided, um, um, polarized across lines of, of class and culture and place and belief um, to try to remind us of the things that we all feel together. We all experience grief in the same way. We all experience joy and wonder in the same way. And I think that's the reason poetry has called me back in these times, really not just this year, um, but for the last several years, I've been turning more and more to poets um, for, for, um, for special, the, the, the kind of comfort I need in this, these times because poetry has that unique capacity to wake up your brain and also calm it down at the same time uh, to quiet it. So last year, um, when I was thinking about what to do next, well, actually over the last couple of years, poetry had been speaking to me so much that I thought this would be a good time for me to gather up all the poetry that I've been writing in recent years and, and send it out into the world as a collection. I had no idea it would be this world exactly um, but I'm, I'm glad uh, to be able to, to send this book into the world. And this is the book. It's, um, it's very beautiful. I'm, uh, and I can, I can say that because I had nothing to do with the packaging, um, except to say, yes, I like it. It's hard to get the light quite right. Um, 
I'm very grateful to my publisher for honoring my poetry with this gorgeous package. And um, I'm gonna so I'm gonna read to you from this book uh, for about, I don't know, 20 minutes or so, and then we'll take your questions and we'll have a conversation. Um, this, um, I can tell you a little more later if you're curious about sort of how this book came to be, but I think that I can tell you in general, it's the most, it's probably the most personal work I've ever published, mainly because I tend to write poems without thinking at all of audience. I don't think about them even being published. Um, I just write them. And so it really contains, it's a more spiritual book than I've, than I've published before. And it really contains um, the closest I've ever come to, 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 write, to making a, a public statement of faith. And the title poem is really uh, just that. It's, it's my answer to those hard questions that our children ask us and that we ask ourselves about why we're here, what happens when we die, um, sort of what's the, what's the point of everything. Um, this is How to Fly in 10,000 Easy Lessons. Behold your body as water and mineral worth, the self-same water that soon, from a tree's way of thinking, soon will be lifted through the elevator hearts of a forest, returned to the sun in a leaf-eyed gaze, and the rest, all wordless leavings, the perfect bone-white ash of you, light as snowflakes, falling on updrafts toward the unbodied breath of a bird. Behold your elements reassembled as pieces of sky, ascending without regret, for you've been lucky enough. Fallen for the last time into a slump, the wrong crowd, love. You've made the best deal. You summited the mountain or you didn't. Anything left undone, you can slip like a cloth bag of marbles into the hands of a child who will be none the wiser. Imagine your joy on rising. Repeat as necessary. <coughs> Thank you. It's the hardest thing about virtual events is the, the dead silence after the end of a reading. Um, but I trust you're there. Um, the, um, Another, the, the, the first section of this book is all how-to poems, and they're very practical things, of course, like how to fly, um, how to do absolutely nothing. <coughs> Excuse me. Isn't it funny these days when you have to really apologize for every cough? Just have a little tickle. <coughs> um, as I said, this book was entirely um, 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 put together before any of us imagined a pandemic. And then this early this year, um, during the pandemic, early this summer, when we sent the manuscript out for uh, to different you know magazines and publications, um, for to choose you know one poem to run for what they call first serial rights, everybody chose this one. Uh, it ended up running in the New York Times, but somehow everyone thought this one was written for the pandemic. It was actually written years ago, but. I think the truth is 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 uh, is is indelible and permanent. That no matter how terrible we think things are, they could be worse. So that's the, that's this poem. How to survive this? Oh misery! Imperfect universe of days stretched out ahead. The string of pearls and drops of venom on the web. Losses of heart, of life and limb news of the worst. Remind me again, the day will come when I look back amazed at the waste of sorry salt when I had no more than this to cry about. Now I lay me down. I'm not there yet. Um, gonna skip ahead. Um, there, the book is divided into sections, and one section um, 
uh, is all poems for it's all uh, eulogy poems, uh, poems that I've written for for beloved dead, my beloved dead people I've lost over the years. And part of that is because I'm the person in my family who is uh, nominated to write and read a poem at the funeral. So I've done that quite a lot. And of course, not all of them are, you know, universe have a universal value that um, sufficient to their, you know, inclusion in a book, but a lot of them did. And I really, you know, I, I was of two minds about including a whole section of dead people poems in this book again not knowing that it would be a year when we have all lost people and we are surrounded by grief and memory of our dead um but i decided ultimately to include these poems because what struck me as i i guess there are about eight or nine of them and they're all really different and what struck me was that there are so many that first of all that death is an important part of life we don't in in this culture we're not allowed to talk about it very much and there are so many different ways that death comes into our lives um um and has value in our lives um as we carry on so i'm going to read just a couple of those poems the first one is is called burying ground because i think all of us have buried at least someone in the last uh seven months this cemetery is full of sorry this cemetery is full of too much living leaves of grass exhaling under our polished shoes trees too burnished with copper plate autumn a sky too elated today to revoke a touch our skin remembers as kin to cast a voice still in our ears into the hushed ground and this air too much like breath. The children too wonderstruck with strange fortune in this ranging throng of cousins, their black skirts twirling like pinwheels over the stony lawn, bouquets of dark flowers hurled into sunshine, hearts full afraid of the asking price. Too much for this day, if this is the end of the world. Um, you might have noticed or might not have noticed that there was um, that that poem had um, had a lot of rhymes in it. I um, I really love formal poetry, and there is some formal po poetry in this book. There is there is a billanelle. Uh, there are some um, uh, sestinas, um, and I was nervous about that initially because I think. Uh, I feel like modern readers feel that uh, formal poetry is is corny or something. Maybe it's you know maybe it's because we all you know memorized too much Christina Rossetti or read too much Dr. Seuss or something uh, growing up to think of it as an adult form. But my British publisher and my British poetry editor was very um, reinforcing as she you know as I worked on the manuscript through several editions. And, 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 and so, uh, she and a number of other friends who are poets advised me, why not do with poetry those things that only poet, a, a poem can do? So there are also, there are shaped poems in here that, that have a shape that reflects the, the theme of the poem and all that. And it was, I really enjoyed embracing formal poetry. And that poem I just read to you, um, it doesn't have end rhymes, but it has internal rhyme, and each line is linked uh, to the to the next line through uh, an internal rhyme. And this one that I'm going to read to you is a it's actually a sestina, um, which means it has six uh, six line stanzas, and the end, the final word of each line in a in a perfect sestina. There's a very strict way that the that the that the end of each line, uh, the, the the end word, the final word of each line is repeated. In this, this is a little bit more of a, a loose sestina, but the the um, the each line ends with a word that will be repeated. So there's uh, later in the poem. So there's this 
flow of repetition that I think um, reinforces the poem, which is about housework. And it's about um, a plate that was, that was passed down in my family. It's more than 100 years old. It was a, a wedding gift to my great grandmother. And uh, every time I use it, of course, I think about her. And so um, um, that's the poem, uh, My Great Grandmother's Plate. And it is for Lily Auksher, who was born in 1881, died in 1965. New Year's morning, standing at the sink, watching new snow drift, I cosset a hope that this weather might persist, bundling a household of family into one more day as mine before the world calls us out again. It whitens the woods while I weather a washing up from last night's happy ending. The grass-stemmed goblets, dorsal spines of underwater forks, and last, the white china platter with lattice edges, a gift to my great-grandmother for her wedding. I use this plate because I want to know how it, might me, how it might make me one with her. My hands slipped into hers like a pair of gloves as I lift and admire its fragile rim, sharing our standing as householders, dutiful washers of porcelain. But instead, a presence from behind me takes my shoulders and I feel her dread of a snow like this for her new husband's sake. A man called out to cattle in any weather. Feel her brooding on a shuttered up morning for its cost in coal. This delicate wedding gift might plague her for the note her mother will be expecting soon along with other good news. A washing up left for the morning would not have been her liberty. My hands may reach, but cannot share this porcelain gift. The newest stake of her household, the oldest one in mine. Uh, the next section of, I'm just giving you a little tour of the book, reading a little bit from each section. The next one is, um, it's, uh, it's called Walking Each Other Home, and it is all poems uh, for about the, the ties that bind us, family and friends, um, the people who get us through um, hard times. And I, I'll read you uh, this poem called Walking Each Other Home. Sorry, that's my dog. If you hear the sounds of home, that's because that's where we are. Walking each other home. My friend lives on this road, the same as me, two hollows down, two gladed mountainsides, briar patches that go without saying, fields in pumpkin or hay or fallow. Once we can never forget a bear. And once for too long a season, a road killed deer whose return to dust we both watched, the ragged pelt dried to leather, the shipwreck of rib cage. My friend alone saw the bear and told me of it, the winter of her chemo. I was the one to see the deer, fresh struck, and had to find words, though even now I can hardly bear to say how I watched hooves beating air, reaching for some blind heaven. Between us, we know this map by heart. I walk from my house to hers, and then together we speak of things, or don't, we are often quiet. All the way back home to mine, or she walks here first, collects me for her return. Either way, this is the road where we live. Always we walk each other home, and always we walk some of it alone. Um, the looking at the time. Okay, we're doing well. Um, the next section is called Dancing with the Devil, and it is uh, poems about art, poems about writing and reading and um, what art does for us. 
um, sort of some sort of meta poems here, poetry about poetry, but um, um, hopefully entertaining and sometimes lighthearted. This one, but I thought I should read this because it's about reading and this is, here we are in a virtual library. So this is called Thief. I read Dickens by dim lamplight, casing the joint for plots. This will not be a holdup, no clearing out whole cash drawers into my bag, just a shoplifter's itch. I'll take the convict benefactor, the woman who knits rebellions into my pockets. Wolf, that's with two O's, Virginia Wolf, I read in my room behind a locked door where she commands me to empty out everything like airport security, nothing. Walk naked through the passage, but quick as life, I swipe her badge, make off with her authority. Emerson, Shelley, Dylan Thomas, H.D., I read with my face planted, belly to earth, leavings of the infinite composting in my rib cage, sun and rain on my back, bringing up a pelt of new grass. Ah, then the last section of the book is called um, The Nature of Objects, and it is all poems that were inspired um, by natural things, uh, natural beings, um, other species. Um, they're important to me. Uh, they're important to you, too. We don't always think about it enough, but every breath we take was recently inside a leaf. Um, every chair we sit on was at one time a tree. Um, likewise, the books that we read are made of the macerated hearts of trees. Um, and it's not just about what they can do for us. It is about, um, it is about the interconnectedness of being on which we fully depend. Um, we're just like every other species in that we like our own kind the best. Um, we're pretty blind to everything else. It's, it's interesting to me that people talk about, I mean, most, most people live in cities now. Um, we have as a, as a global population moved from mostly urban to mostly rural. So most people spend their days completely surrounded by human made objects and think of that as the world. And if they do go and visit nature, they think of it as a thing, you know, a, a, a place to go uh, and, and, and visit and then come back to the real world. But that in fact is the real world. Uh, we are one of millions of living, uh, living kinds on this earth, and we're not alone in our uh, egotism, our blindness to other species. I mean, I have a, there's a Carolina wren that perch, uh, every morning of the summer perches on the gutter right outside my bedroom, and he sings this song, and I know his song is, this is my place, I own this thing, this whole territory is mine, mine, mine. Uh, babes come and visit, you know, and he's not thinking of me. He doesn't think this is my house. It's his house. So I get that. I get that we're all kind of hard, hardwired to pay the most attention to ourselves. But we, we humans have such magnificent imaginations, such big brains, and such a capacity to alter our world um, in such a selfish manner that we are outliving our own possibility of inhabiting this planet. And um, that has never been more true than in the last four years. Um, I think that we've all been paying a lot of attention to the ways that um, our nation has become a place of, of people hating people. Uh, people damaging people, uh, people being damaged by, uh, by, by, by ill will. 
What has slipped by mostly unnoticed is the damage that our nation has wrought on the rest of the world um, in ways that are coming to be almost irreversible. And just to give you an example, just an example, today, um, uh, the US government opened up the Tongass National Forest. Um, you probably know, or you might not know where that is. It's, it's the, the coast um, of, of uh, it's the part of Alaska that comes down the coast um, um, along sort of the, the west coast of Canada. And it is, there's an enormous primary forest there. Uh, and today, the US government opened 9 million acres, that whole forest, which belongs to you and me. It's a national forest. It was given to loggers. It was the whole 9 million acres of uh, primary forest was uh, opened for logging, open for business. Some deal was cut for somebody. That was today. I can hardly bear it. Um, what I can do about it and what you can do about it, because a lot of you live in Pennsylvania, is please vote. Um, that's all I'm going to, no, it's not all I'm going to say. You probably have, but if you haven't filled out that ballot, get it in there, that naked envelope, whatever you need to do, do it right, um, put it in the drop box, and then Turn your energies to all the other people you know and all the people you don't know who haven't done it yet. Please, please, for the sake of this planet, please do that. Um, so so uh, I'm going to read you this poem called Great Barrier. It's about our failure to love across the divide between ourselves um, and others, the othering of all other species. Great Barrier. The cathedral is burning. Absent flame or smoke, stained glass explodes in silence. Fractal scales of angel, damsel, rainbow, parrot. Charred beams of blackened coral lie in heaps on the sacred floor. White stones fallen from high places, spires collapsed, crushing the sainted turtle and gargoyle octopus. Something there is in my kind that cannot love a reef, a tundra, a plain stone breast of desert ever quite enough. A tree, perhaps, once recomposed as splendid furniture. A forest, after the whole of it is planed to posts and beams and raised to a heaven of earnest construction in the name of Our Lady. All Paris stood on the bridges to watch her burning. Believing a thing this old, this large and beautiful must be holy and cannot be lost. And coral temples older than Charlemagne suffocate unattended. Bleach and bleed from the eye, the centered heart. Lord of leaves and fishes, lead me across this great divide. Teach me how to love the sacred places, not as one devotes to one who made me in his image and is bound to love me back. I mean, as a body loves its microbial skin, the worm, its nape of loam, all secret otherness forgiven. Love beyond anything I will ever make of it. Thank you. Um, I think I'll read one more poem, this is, uh, and then we'll go to questions if that sounds all right. Um, your silence, uh, I will take for uh, the fact that this is a virtual reading. Um, this is the last poem in the book. I've actually never read it at a reading before, but tonight I'm, I'm moved to do that. Um, and I'll tell you just in, in as background, I, um, I was lucky enough to get to go to Australia and I, sw I swam the Great Barrier Reef, which was inspiration for the poem that I just read you. Um, much of it is still alive and beautiful. And of course, much of it is dying because of uh, climate change, because warmer air makes uh, acidic oceans, which kill ultimately everything living there. Um, 
So I wanted there I had a list of things I wanted to see in in Australia and they're not I'm a I was trained as a biologist I'm a nature nerd and a biology nerd and I have always been fascinated by the fact that once upon a time all of the continents were one and the flora of of this continent uh, of Gondwana land was all you know one big forest and then it broke apart and um Antarctica used to be of course a part of that and it had forests on it and there's a particular kind of tree called uh antarctic beaches which originally were antarctic trees back when you know there was a forest there and there's a relic of this forest that's thousands of years old individual trees thousands of years old up on this high escarpment um this, this big mountain um that you have to climb in the great dividing range of australia and i was going to see those beaches and it was a it was a big endeavor but i climbed up there and i saw those trees and i was moved beyond it was a religious experience i was moved beyond words uh well ultimately you know i always find words but i was i was powerfully moved by the age of those trees and also derived great hope from the age of those trees thinking about everything they've seen uh in their time uh because trees do see and they do know they in their in their own way and they speak to each other they communicate and i mean this isn't crazy stuff this is science they communicate chemically um and just being there among them made me feel so small and so insignificant which is really a comforting thing when you think of humans as potentially lethal uh creatures it is good sometimes to understand our smallness. So this is the poem, uh, Forests of Antarctica. From here, the oldest trees will speak to one another in the oldest language. Chemical breath, touch in darkness, rootlets seeking rootlets, holding hands underground for sucker. And I could pass among them hearing nothing, or I could pause on the tilted light of slate scrabbled path in a silence of moss and try to fathom their stillness. How nothing stirs their hearts. How patience is a promise a seed makes to its ground. From the day of cracking and rooting in, clinging to this escarpment since before the trial of Socrates, before the tilting up of plinths at Stonehenge, already ringed with moss and age when Jesus walked out of Nazareth. Betrothal of these giants to their place has left them crouched on buttressed trunks high above the ground, leg roots exposed by all the rains that have washed the earth out from under them, since the beginning. Everything has already happened here. Still, the ancient beaches hold their ground with moss knuckled toes, remembering a Gondwana land of their youth when far away Antarctica was yet a forested nation. Standing shoulder to shoulder, they braced for the breaking apart of the known, a rumbling violence of stones mountain dashed against mountain two ships parting the tree the trees exhaled in communion rode their new continents survived the end of one world in the great dividing range i crave to repent in filtered tree fern light i confess the sins of my tribe we worship the future demean the past pay no mind to the present. But a future cut off from the promise of ever joining history lies already dead on its altar while we chew on our own restless feet. What's to become of our own seeds and betrothals? All these floss haired children inside us that want to live, want to move, stay, eat the soil from under the house, move on want to hold fast, but cannot hold still. I am lifting them up as newborns to the nursery window, looking out on the forests of Antarctica. I tell them, this is your home. 
Tell them, none of this is yours. Do not believe as I did. When the world breaks open, fall apart with her entrails. Fall with the stones or fly. Let the crush of it make you into some new thing, not yourself. See how these trees take the teat of the world and suckle it, drinking time, knowing it is perfect with or without them. Lacking their religion, you will have to make your own. You are the world that stirs. This is the world that waits. <laughs> Thank you. I'm getting a little applause here. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I appreciate that. Um, and I guess we're ready for questions now. We are ready for questions. I want to let you know that your audience is with you. They are Thank here. You. And on behalf of everyone, I so appreciate that reading. And just a reminder, last time you visited us, there was a very long standing ovation. And no doubt <laughs> there would have been one tonight as well. Thank you. So our first question is from Katie. You mentioned that this is a collection of poems you've written over many years. What was the process of deciding which poems to include and which to leave out? Did you have any favorites that didn't make the cut? Um, that's a good question. It was, um, it was first of all, a kind of a surprise to me that the book would be published at all. Um, I've always loved, uh, always loved poetry as a reader and as a writer. It was actually the first form that I took seriously as a, as a young writer. Um, and, but then I discovered that no one really pays you to write a poem <laughs> or to write poetry. Um, poets generally, not generally, always um, have to teach or you know go uh, around giving readings and do other things to make a living. Um, and it was a, a great surprise to me that when I, after I wrote a novel, uh, I got this big check. Well, it seemed like a big check at the time. Um, and I looked at it and I said, hmm, if I'm really frugal, I can live on this for a year and write another novel. And so I became a novelist by profession. And I know that's not exactly what your question was, but I'm getting to it. Um, um, it's, I guess I'm kind of answering a question that, that a lot of people have asked, which is, you know, we thought you were a novelist. What's the deal with poetry? And the deal is I always wrote it, but didn't really. And I published a collection of poetry in 1992. And since then I've been writing poems, but not really expecting, not thinking much about their publication. And that's why um, my poetry tends to be much more intimate and more personal. Um, than, than, than my other work, uh, because I'm just doing it for me. I'm not, I mean, it's not like it's therapy. I don't mean that. It's not like a journal or something. I mean, I craft poems as poetry, but they, they um, I do them without, without a, a lot of thought to their marketing or whatever, if you see what I mean. So I have these poems and um, Last summer, I had a conversation with my editor, uh, Terry Carton at HarperCollins, who said, well, you know, I'd finished Unsheltered and finished the tour. And she said, well, what are you working on now? And I said, well, I have three, three, book, three, I, three books that could be next. One is a novel. One is a collection of essays. And I also have all these poems, but I know you don't want to publish those. I mean, that's, that was what I said. I thought, no, I don't want, you know... I don't want you to do this as a favor. She, she surprised me. She said, I would love to, pub to publish your poetry. So it was a little bit of a shock to bring all these poems out of a drawer and first winnow through them and find, you know, sort of first decide which ones, I mean, all of them of course would need to be revised because that's what you do when you're preparing a book, you make everything, you know, as perfect as you can. Some of them were vestigial some of them were more or less you know finished but um i i first without even thought to organization i pulled out the ones that i felt had the most universal value um as i said earlier the whole collection of elegy poems i set aside i thought i don't really know if these belong um some were extremely intimate very uh revealing um, about personal, my relationship with my mother, for example, which I've never, ever written about. But um, 
my mother died, uh, has, is, is now, is no longer living. And that gave me a kind of freedom to think, well, this might be, you know, a time when I could publish more of this, uh, kind of more, more personal work. If I feel that it's, it's also universal, if I feel it speaks to other people in a valuable way. So that was my first and so I've already told you that one of, there's a poem about the death of my mother that I was not going to include. Um, but some people saw it and said, no, this, this needs to be in the book. So, um, so, and there's a long poem about, um, um, about fairly, when I say long, it's like three pages long about, uh, that was written in, uh, uh, in your city. Um, um, after I got a terrible review and I, and I, and I just was dead, it was devastating. And I went to a museum to try to just be, be comforted by art. And I ended up having this conversation like in my mind with a painting. Um, and it, it ended up being this whole, uh, conversation about how art never dies and how art is much more important than the critic or the artist or or anything else it's about the conversation that happens between the the reader and 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 the writer the artist and the viewer um so that one i wasn't sure about um there are several others that i was very uncertain about oh there's one called how to do absolutely nothing and i thought who wants to read this so so i i put a lot of poems in that I had doubts about and ended up including them because I was encouraged to do so. And I have to say that every poem that I worried, the poems I worried most about, I've already heard from people um, with the sentiment that those were the most useful to them. Those, they love those, they were the favorites. They were the favorites. Um, those poems were their favorites. So I think it's not, a, it's it's not a new uh, observation that the the things we do that feel riskiest to us as writers are often the most rewarding to readers. Thank you. Does the framing on the page of this is how they come back to us represent the simultaneity of time in memory? Yes. <laughs> Good, obs good observation. That that's a kind of a shape poem in a in a sort of limited way. That it's it's right. I guess I could show it to you if you have the book. Um, oh, here it is. I don't know if you can see. It's right justified. Normally, you know, poems are left justified, or anything we read is left justified. It all starts in the same place on the left and ends you know, like here, there, or everywhere on the right. This is the opposite, the end point, because it's a poem about the ways, all the different fragments of memory we have when we look back on a person and how the whole, uh, it's all its all there at once, the end and the beginning, that's the end of the poem. All these parts, it's about remembering my grandfather. Um, all, of, all these parts of his life are equal now the end and the beginning. And what I was suggesting with the shape of the poem is that they start, these memories start at many different points, but they all end at the same place, which was death. So somebody was on the ball there. Thank you for noticing. And of course, when I turned that in, the editors thought this was a mistake. You meant this left justified, right? And I said, no, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I do miss our smart audience. That's for that's sure. That's right. Uh, two questions. These are from Julie and Martha um, saying a similar thing, which is, who is your favorite poet? And also, are there any poets that particularly speak to you in these current times? There are. I there are many poets I love. I, I love to read poetry at the end of, I love for poetry to be the last thing I read before I go to sleep at night, because I think of it as flossing the word loving parts of my brain. Um, um, and, and I go through sort of spells of different favorite poets. Mary Oliver is always, um, always my friend. She's always com a comfort to me. Um, I love Lucille Clifton. I think her poems are 
especially relevant in this in these times because she wrote um i mean i i, I kind of hate that word domestic because people think of it as as uh, condescending but it's not the the immensity of the world within the home within the family she raised six children and her poems uh are short because and I heard her say this in a reading, um, that, that's about as many lines as she could hold in her head until the end of the day when she got to write. So her poems about family and home and um, and uh, just the, the, the small sphere, um, I think is really valuable right now when we are all learning uh, to make more out of less, to be, to find contentment with what we have. So who else? I love, um, I love Emily Dickinson for the same reason. Here was someone who self-quarantined for 26 years, the last, the last decades of her life. She never left home. Um, and she found the world uh, and wrote about it and brings it to us. I love, um, Claudia Rankin. I love Nikki Giovanni, uh, who I think was just there. Uh, I love, um, um, did I say Dylan Thomas? I just, I could read, I could read um, Under Milkwood, just on continuous loop because of the way his use of language. Um, um, the list goes on and on, but um, those are some, those are some favorites. If you were in the auditorium and said that poetry is like flossing the word loving parts of your brain, you would have received a round of applause. <laughs> yeah. well, uh, this you. question is from Suzanne. I hear a lot lately about how writers and artists and musicians should use their craft and talent to discuss social justice issues. What are your thoughts on that responsibility? Responsibility in quotes. Um, I don't think there's any should. Uh, I think each of us decides um, what move, you know, each, w w good art comes from passion. Uh, that's the bottom line. What moves us will get us to our, 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 our desk every day or our easel or, or our musical instrument. And that's how we make good work is getting to the desk and staying there and doing the work day after day. So I've always been moved by the things that worry me most, which end up being, you know, issues of justice, of power and unequally distributed power and resources, um, uh, divisions of class, of gender, um, abuse of the natural world. These things have always worried me ever since I was a kid. Uh, those are the things that, um, that move me when I read about them. Um, I, I guess because that's the the real world as I perceive it. Um, so, um, so to me, the platform carries a responsibility of taking seriously that I'm using. I'm asking people to give me uh, their time. You know, um, you have many other things you could be doing, and so if I'm going to bother you with you know, with a poem or more, even more so a novel, you know, if I'm saying, give me 10 hours of your time, I want to give you something back that, that matters, not just the opportunity to have forgotten your own life for 10 hours, which might be, you know, what you get from like streaming, I don't know, Bob's Burgers. I don't know. I don't want to, I don't want to single out anything as, 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 uh, as pure entertainment, but um, I feel like I have, I feel like I have a responsibility to take this platform seriously and address the real world and the things that I see as significant. And I also think that if, as long as I can imagine a better world than this one, and if I can have a conversation with you about that, then I want to do that. But it's not, it's not mine to to say anyone else what any other artist should do i will tell you this though the world over most people mo most cultures mo uh people in most societies look to their artists as the bellwethers of social change if you look at 
you know, artists, writers in Latin America, writers in Africa. Um, if you look at who's won the Nobel Prize year after year after year, they are always artists that we would call political. And it used to be so here too. John Steinbeck, for example, was, was, was considered a very important and serious artist who wrote about issues of class and social justice. That changed in the 1950s when we had the McCarthy uh, witch hunts and there was a, a scouring of, of politics from art in this country in a devastating way. A lot of, a lot of artists lost their livelihoods and the, and the, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, like, it's a kind of cultural genocide. It's like when you wipe out a generation that doesn't just pop back up again. It has taken us half a century to recover from that. So it's really only in the last half decade, I think, that um, we're again feeling, starting to feel free to celebrate art and politics. And I'll remind you that I've been writing for 30 years. And I'll tell you that for the first 20 years of that career, the, I was continually scolded for being a so-called political artist because somebody had decided that wasn't allowed. I never thought of myself as a political artist. I think of myself as an artist. I think about craft. I just try really hard to make my work good work, but the material I address tends to be real world based, based on problems. So it's it's been very interesting to me to see as I become um, a silver haired writer, uh, I, I see that the, this sort of, this sort of, um, uh, disapproval that I kind of weather had to weather for decades is start starting to lift and I'm so happy for younger writers who are coming up in these times but they still need our support it's still not easy because in there's always you know with publishing a, a concern about will this be marketable you know do people really want to read about difficult things the answer is yes but we need to convince uh convince that with our with our dollars. So please support the artists you like by buying your book of their books and please support uh, support your library and also su support your independent bookstores as much as you can because they desperately need you right now. Um, if you want this country to have one retailer only <laughs> for everything that uh, with a name that starts with a then sure go ahead and buy your books and your shoes and your whatever coffee filters and everything from there. But if you care about democracy and freedom of information and ideas, please support your libraries and your independent bookstores. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for saying all of that. A few questions about your writing process. I'm gonna to try to combine them. Um, okay. What is your everyday writing process and how has it changed during the pandemic? And does your writing process differ from when you're writing poetry than when you're writing a novel? Um, it does. Yeah, that's several questions. I'll start with the pandemic. Um, look, I'm a professional introvert. I, <laughs> I like going into a room, closing the door and spending the whole day with my imaginary friends in my in my head. I've all, I mean, you if to, especially as a novelist, you have to really be comfort. You have to love your own company. You know, you have to be very comfortable in a room by yourself. Really, and it's it's funny because it's not even about loving your own company. You forget that you have a you. I mean, I when I'm writing a novel, I forget that there is a me. I just go into that other world and I stay there. And I and, and it's solitude. What you have to love is solitude to do this. You know most of your waking hours, day after day, month after month, year after year. So I was pre-adapted for the pandemic. My work schedule itself has changed very little. I, I get up in the morning and I get to my desk as much as I can, as, as quickly as I can and stay there as long as I can because I love to write. As a working writer, one has to do many other things. Um, you know, it just like you wouldn't believe how many other things. And so I try to sort of, 
I have an assistant who takes care of a lot of that stuff. And we, you know, meet for lunch every day and she goes over and asks, you know, do you want to speak to the garden club of blah, blah, blah? No, thank you. You know, just like all of these requests that come in. But a lot of, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't traipse around and talk a lot uh, because that's not what I do. I'm a writer, but there are a lot of other requests that, you know, that I do. Um, gratify and assignments that I take and things, people that I help out and all this and that. I have, a, I established a prize and I help administer that. So I do all those other things, but what I love is to write. And I've always really been jealous of my, gar gu I've jealously guarded my writing time because I've been a mother the exactly as long as I've been a professional novelist, the same day that I brought home my first baby from the hospital, I got my first contract for The Bean Trees, my first novel. So bam, it happened like that. And I had to learn uh, quickly that like any working parent, I can only work when my children are, were, when, I mean, they're grown now, um, but um, I could only work when they were in someone else's care that I had to pay for out of my meager earnings as a star starving artist. So. You know, I developed uh, habits of great efficiency. I always said the school, my muse is the school bus. It takes them, I go, I work. I don't need to, you know, get in the mood. I just go to it. And even though my kids, as I said, are, are adults now, um, uh, I still work that way. Um, as if, you know, as if the school bus was going to bring them back any minute and I would have to stop and go put the lasagna in the oven. So, um, so that's that. I mean, what has changed is book tour. Uh, normally, be getting in every, going to Philadelphia and going and going and going to UC Santa Barbara, where I was, you know, yesterday and, uh, and coming home exhausted. So this is um, really much nicer. I worked on my novel all day today and then I snapped out of it, made a cup of tea and I came to talk with you. So um, if you like this kind of book touring, I, I, I do too. I hope, I hope it will stick. I mean, of course, there's much to be said for the, for, you know, of course I miss personal interaction. And um, as I said, it is really weird to read to a complete complete silence. I do love getting feedback, but I also think that we are all learning um, of necessity that there are many other ways to be together that are more efficient of our time and more importantly, more efficient of our resources. So we're not burning jet fuel every minute for things that we don't necessarily need to do in places we didn't really have to go. So um, I think I think there are a million ways that this time is tr teaching us that a lot of the things we thought we needed, we maybe didn't really need, and a lot of what we want, we maybe already had. Um, this is not to say, uh, this is not to overlook the devastating losses of of people, of employment, of security and safety. And I'm, I'm, I'm terribly sorry to all of you for everything you've lost. I've lost people too. Um, uh, but, but I live in a beautiful place where I'm happy. I'm not, I'm, I'm really lucky that I'm not closed in a little apartment with, you know, with toddlers or something. And so I, I don't mean to, um, to sort of, to overlook the difficulty of this time, but I think um, very little good comes out of complacency. And these have been times of no complacency. So that's my thinking. All right, we have time for just one last question. It's difficult to choose. How does your process for writing poetry differ from writing a novel? Ah, that's the part of that last question I didn't answer. Thank you. Um, it, it is a good question. It feels different. It's sort of, I would compare the difference of the, the process of writing a novel versus writing a poem to the difference between a marriage 
and a fabulous first date. <laughs> what is a commitment? You know, a novel, you just, you get in there and you're in there for years and you, you, you have to make it work. And sometimes the people in there aren't getting along and you have to put everybody through therapy. You just, you know, you just have to keep pushing. And I mean, I do love writing novels, uh, but it's also, um, it's, you know, uh, in sickness and in health kind of thing. It's a long-term commitment. Whereas a poem, I'll come, a, a poem will occur to me usually sort of in a, a flash of insight. I will, it's often, I feel like the genesis of a poem is often realizing two previously unacquainted things might kiss, you know, and kind of blow up, you know, the sort of these, the neurons of happiness in your brain when you realize, wow, those two things have come together in a way I never thought they could come before. So when I realize, when I see those two things and I see how I might make them kiss on the page, um, I'll sit down and try to draft that out. And if it's working, like, a, like, as I said, a fabulous first date, it's all fun and this is cool and this is great. And if it's not working, then I get up and say, okay, bye, done. <laughs> um, that's not to say, of course, that I finish a poem in one sitting, but I'll often draft a complete poem in one sitting, come back to it another day, um, usually take half of it out because I tend to write long. Um, the poets I admire most are the ones who, who write really short poems uh, and they're perfect, you know, and I'm always wanting to do that. For this book, my my goal was to get every poem on one page and I almost did. There's a, there are a few that needed to be longer. Uh, and then there's one that's supposed to be like, it's, it's a long prose poem that was meant to be longer. But um, usually I, you know, I end up taking you know, sort of cutting, cutting, cutting down to the bone, and then I see where it stands, and then, you know, and, and of course, it's all about the language and listening, listening to the insides of the words and thinking about the connotations of the words and kind of what's the difference between fixed and mended, you know, and how do these words uh, get along with the words on either side of them and the ones in the following lines. And so, you know, hearing the sounds of the words and tasting them, I just love all that. I just love playing with words. And poetry is really the high, the fine, the greatest distillation of craft. So I find that really gratifying, uh, really fun. And I, I often do, I don't, well, with this book, I would just, I just, you know, had whole days where I just would work on the book, you know, getting it and sort of thinking about editing it and, and placement and all that. Generally, a poem will just be, you know, an afternoon affair, you know, and then I'll come back to it on another afternoon while I'm writing other things. Now, when I go through spates of writing poems, when I'm writing a novel, a lot of what would be poems end up going into the novel. It's just, you know, because a, no a novel starts when I'm really into a novel, it just absorbs everything. It's like this black hole, you know, everything I see or think or hear or dream somehow finds its way. You know, I sort of, it's, it, it becomes shaded with meaning and I see how to, 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 to slice it in and how the language can elevate, you know, this scene or this chapter. So my novels, I have to tell you, have cannibalized hundreds if not thousands of poems but that's okay too because there's a place for poetry you know po i mean literary literary fiction needs to be made of poetry really the language has to be poetic so that's okay and we can you know we can forgive those novels for the poems that they've eaten but it's also nice in between novels to attend to poems and let them let them live you know let them have lives of their own so um so those are all such good questions, and I see it's it's past eight thirty. So, um, so thank you uh, for spending this hour um, together with poetry and and libraries. And sorry for uh, for delivering a lecture about voting, but I know I know I'm it's falling on. Uh, I, I know I'm preaching to the choir, right? But just make me feel better promise you'll get those ballots in and you'll you'll maybe get some other people to get their ballots in nothing has ever been more important and no the one thing that's more important 
is that you remain hopeful. This is not a time to give up. We can't. Um, so I'm going to close uh, on a note of hope um, by reading a poem about this. Um, Emily Dickinson, I love, of course, her poem about hope. She saw it as this bird that comes and perches in your chest and it sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And I love that. Um, and I can see that. But for me, it's not a bird. For me, hope is, it's not even a thing that I have. It's a thing that I do, that we do. We, uh, it's what we, it's something we make. And it's not a choice. It's a duty. It's an obligation because when we stop being hopeful, we turn our backs on the world, um, the world that will go to hell in a handbasket, and we turn our backs on all the kids who are going to have to live in it. And that's immoral. It's just, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not doable. So how do you keep it up? You just do it. It's like an engine. You get up in the morning and you and you tinker with it till you get it running and it's going to peter out by the end of the day, which is fine. You go to bed, you get up in the morning and you just get that hope going again. Um, so this is, this is my poem that I want to leave you with, How to Be Hopeful. Look, you might as well know this device is going to take endless repair. Rubber cement, rubber bands, tapioca, the square of the hypotenuse, 19th century novels, sunrise, any of these could be helpful. Also feathers. The ignition is tricky. Sometimes you have to stand on an incline where things look possible. Or a line you drew yourself or the grocery line, making faces at a toddler secretly over his mother's shoulder. You may have to pop the clutch and run past the evidence, past everyone who is praying for you. Passing all previous records is okay, or passing strange, just not passing it up. Or park it and fly by the seat of your pants, with nothing in the bank, you will still want to take the express. Tiptoe past the dogs of the apocalypse, asleep in the shade of your future. Pay at the window. You'll be surprised. You can pass off hope like a bad check. You still have time, that's the thing, to make it good. Thank you so much. I thank you so much, Barbara, for joining us tonight. And I thank you to all of you out there, wherever you are, for joining us as well. Have a nice evening. Bye.